Hoxton, in East London, is today a fashionable district known for entertainment and its vibrant art scene. The area was once, however, very different. In the past, it was a working-class district contiguous with Shoreditch. Long before the 1980s and 90s, when industrial lofts and workshops began to be occupied by artists, galleries, creative industries, offices and shops, the district was characterised by Victorian terraces, warehouses and factories, this 19th-century suburb in turn having replaced much older broken-up estates of wealthy landowners on the city's borders. Today, you will discover what life was like in 19th-century Hoxton through the eyes of the Victorian investigator Charles Booth, 1840-1916. Booth is perhaps best known for his Inquiry into Life and Labour in London, a study of working-class life in London towards the end of the 19th century. It is thanks to his account and the police that accompanied him on his investigation of the East End that we can bring to light the reality of life for its inhabitants. His poverty maps are a well-known, colour-coding the very poorest streets in dark colours compared to the bright colours of wealthy neighbourhoods, if not an overly qualitative representation of social inequality in the metropolis. His study focused more on class difference, moral qualities and character than statistical factors such as income, subjective and with the potential to be influenced by whom he interviewed and their own prejudices and grievances, particularly the police, but perhaps all the more interesting for it. Life in Hoxton wasn't so different for the people who lived there than to those in Bethnal Green to the southeast though by the time of Booth's visit, the extreme deprivation that made the old Nickel Street notorious in that quarter had resulted in its demolition, and the Boundary Estate was under construction. You can find out more about that infamous slum in a video available on my channel. See the links in the description. Charles Booth walked the district in the company of a police constable in 1898 to make observations on the extent of poverty. The following summarises his account of the streets north and west of Hoxton Square and the infamous reputation some of them had with the police. Later in the video, you will hear his general impression of Hoxton and its inhabitants. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, Check out the description for links to ways you can help us continue bringing the past alive. Booth noted that the terraces of the district were home to many artisan cabinet or shoemakers. There were many furniture workshops, one of which had spilled out half-finished wardrobes onto the street. Huxton Square was almost entirely given over to cabinet, table and chair makers though there was a string factory employing 100 boys. There were few houses around the square itself, save for those associated with the Roman Catholic Priory and Anglian Parsonage. A little to the north of Hoxton Square, in St. George's Square, opposite a lunatic asylum on Hoxton High Street, stood dilapidated four-storey buildings, all since demolished which the constable informed was much trouble to the police and the resort of Sunday gamblers, who would often escape up the building's open staircases. Many homes were occupied by more than one family, often three. Some streets were better kept, some worse and run down in appearance, perhaps dependent on the landlord and whether or not they were absentee. On Laburnum Street, the eastern half, controlled by an absentee landlord, Within tenement houses of eight rooms, one-room basements were let to families, to either front or back, the back being cheaper. Here, tailors, boot finishers and matchbox makers lived behind broken and patched windows. The children were noted to be hatless, wearing ragged clothes and boots with holes. Residents caused trouble for the police, though more for being drunk and rowdy than criminal in behaviour. Deprivation appeared to be in pockets, some worse than others. On the Kingsland Road, alongside shops and businesses, stood the Britannia Public House, 
then recently sold for £12,000, no doubt recorded for being a high price and a reflection of the good trade in drink. Not far away, down a flight of steps and hidden behind a terrace of houses, was Mansfield Court. Two cottages let to poor tenant labourers, and yet on Mansfield Street itself, Booth noted better houses, with good washrooms and gardens to the rear occupied by the police, where there was always competition to occupy them if they became vacant. Some of the streets, north of Hugston Square, on what is now the Pitfield Estate, had benefited from landlord repair. Demand to let had increased from tenants working in the city, and increased rents had pushed out the original occupiers. But you could still walk out of one street and into another to find a very different picture. Not far away in Britannia Gardens, the houses were tenanted by costermongers, the street being strewn with piles of packing cases, barrows and barefooted children walking amongst them. This mixed picture of housing quality and type of tenant seems to be the general case with Booth's observations of the streets, leading away from Huxton Square. He sometimes points out streets where the children are booted, clean and well-fed, as a marked contrast to those in poor streets. An observation that really struck Booth was children fetching beer from pubs to take home to parents. The constable thought of it as a horror, more in principle than for the profanity of the language used in public houses. He thought it more likely women would go without if they had to go themselves. In the early 1890s, no policeman would have entered Huxton Market alone. Between Coronet and Boot Streets, the market no longer exists. It was bounded by four-storey buildings to its east and west, and the buildings on its east side were, at that time, occupied by a band of squatters who would pay no rent. There was a lodging house on the southeast corner. It's notable that the police organised a subscription among themselves to pay for bread stamps, which they distributed to the poor. Boot Street, just to the north of Old Street today, was said to be a very shady quarter, a public house on adjacent Charles Street was the known resort of criminals. Not far from City Road, on Craven Street lived prostitutes, with neighbours complaining of two houses at the turning with Brunswick Place, operating as brothels. Not far from City Road, to the north of Old Street, was a block of streets known as the Vinegar Ground, on account of being adjacent a vinegar factory. The taller, five-storey buildings at the end of the streets were described as a den of thieves and prostitutes. These blocks were annotated on Booth's maps in black as being vicious and a place known for assaults on the police. The police constable informed Booth that through the 1890s the district had gone downhill to such an extent that richer people had left, though he qualified his remark to say that poverty that year was not as visible as it had been a good year for trade. Both he and the school board visitor, who he met on his rounds, agreed that better off artisans had moved out easily to take advantage of cheap fares and rapid locomotion, presumably living further out in the suburbs and able to afford rail fare for travel. The constable noticed a decrease in drinking by men, but more by women, and a general increase in hooliganism among all classes. He didn't know why women drank more, but he considered that they had certainly now lost any shame of entering a public house, saying, Women never drink singly, so that evil spreads more quickly than among men. The following account is of Booth's general observations on the lives and living conditions of Huxton's inhabitants, their work, pastimes, and the impact of crime. Huxton is the leading criminal quarter of London, and indeed of all England and it is easy to see how pleasantly, a central and suitable a position, it occupies for nefarious projects, so that it might be not inaptly be described as on the fence between rich and poor. Wall off Huxton, it is said, and nine-tenths of the criminals of London would be walled off, but in saying this, a certain class of criminal only was referred to and the proportion is doubtless exaggerated. Of professional thieves, there are two distinct kinds. 
those who live from day to day by the more casual kind of depredations, and those who lie low while making elaborate plans for some great haul. The latter may maintain a life of apparent respectability, pursuing ostensibly some regular calling, and they bring to bear upon their operations much forethought and some skill. They perhaps have had the training of a carpenter, a blacksmith, or a locksmith. They live the life of the lower middle class. The number of first-class burglars is said to be very small. With most, daring takes the place of skill. But in playing their game against society, what is regarded as unnecessary violence is avoided as a rule. The relations of these men with the police are curious, regulated by certain rules of the game, which provide the rough outlines of a code of what is regarded as fair or unfair. Violence is a breach of these rules, or sometimes the result of their breach, by the other party. But if, fairly taken, no ill will is borne. These men are generally known to the police, and so are the receivers into whose hands they play. Gold or silver stolen anywhere in London comes, it is said, at once to this quarter, and is promptly consigned to the melting pot. Jewellery is broken up. Watches are rechristened. The fences, or receivers of stolen goods, are of all grades, and serve every sort of thief, and in Hoxton thieves of every kind seem to be represented. As in the days of Oliver Twist, the old thieves teach the young. I should suppose that, given some natural capacity in this direction, the very atmosphere of Hoxton would breed handy lads for this business. But it is so much an art that it is said that the supply of young thieves depends on this unindentured form of apprenticeship. I do not know whether the professors are actuated by benevolence only. It would almost seem so. Or whether, as one good turn deserves another, the young can sometimes help the old. No doubt in burglaries a boy is often useful. One of the most notorious developments of juvenile crime has been that of bands of boys, called after this or that street, and making themselves the terror of the neighbourhood. It is said that the bus and tram-car boys, and those who hang round to share their work, provide some of the worst examples. Of these gangs and their fierce quarrels among themselves, turning on the favour of the girls who consort with them, we have heard strange accounts. One of our informants, a schoolmaster, speaks of the terror exercised by the leaders of these boys over their followers. Sitting safe at home, the follower hears the whistle and turns pale, but obeys the summons. It sounds romantic and absurd, but I believe it to be no more than the truth, and to the tragic result of one of these quarrels of a belt and pistol gang which occurred in Haggerston when a girl was fatally wounded and a heavy sentence imposed in consequence, the comparatively orderly state of the streets at the time of our inquiry was attributed. It may be that the blood-curdling pictures of the illustrated gutter press have a stimulating influence, but since few of the boys can read with much facility, the schoolmaster's claim, with some show of reason, that the attraction to evil courses cannot be attributed to the influence of bad literature. Romance plays an extraordinary part in life, and certainly not least so in criminal life. Those who have the excitement of crime and its reality perhaps crave least the relaxation of its literature. When we add to this widespread criminal element a great mass of poverty and extremely low life, fed constantly by demolitions on the city border, and when we remember that over a considerable part of the area, anyone who can rise a little in the world is sure to leave, unless indeed his success in life is connected with thieving or dealing in stolen goods. We may understand how terribly difficult is the task of social or religious reform, and are not surprised to hear of the moral flabbiness of the human material with which the clergy have to deal, both from sanitary and economic causes. There is a good deal of physical weakness. The lads like the amusements of their clubs, but shirk active games, for which indeed it is hard to find a place. The people generally live under extremely crowded conditions. It is stated, not improbably, that about a quarter of them are chronically out of work. And it is also said by one of the clergy 
with perhaps less exactness, that half his parish seems to get drunk every Saturday night. Hoxton has not always been poor and disorderly, and although the description I have given draws most attention to the dark and miserable side of life here, this even now is by no means the only side. Jonah's formula is not applicable. Many decent and worthy people still live in Hoxton, nor can it be denied that there has been in these years a great improvement in Hoxton Market and the neighbourhood. Due, it may be most of all, to demolition and rebuilding, but the evidence shows that the downward change has been very great. A Wesleyan schoolmaster, for instance, who has lived in the neighbourhood of the New North Road for forty-three years, says that in his earlier years it was an eminently respectable locality. As a young man, he remembers going to the Wesleyan church and sitting in the gallery, the better to admire the costly and beautiful dresses of the ladies. He has seen both the rise and fall of Bridport Place and the adjoining streets, their building and occupation by decent people earning £150 to £300 a year, and their gradual decline to their present state of three families to a house. Within his recollection, a sheriff of London lived in the new North Road, and all along the road the houses were kept by one family. A butcher said to him lately, When I came here, soon after you, there was only one family in each house, and they took three or four joints a week. Now there are three or four families in each house, and not one joint between them. They go to Pitfield Street and buy the pieces. The poverty is not incompatible with there being lots of money going. All seem to live largely in the present, seeking to find alleviation in large expenditure on the pleasures of the moment. The public house, the theatre, the music hall, the funeral, the wedding, the jaunt to the forest, and so on. Drink is the great popular extravagance of the poorer class, and it is to this that the existing destitution is largely attributable. But while there is more drinking, there is less drunkenness than formerly. Women go freely to the public houses, but not to drink in solitary fashion. With them, it is a social usage. They treat a friend, or a friend treats them. For children, the sweet shop takes the place of the public house. They are never without money for this indulgence, and they, too, share each other's purchases. In the poor schools, a monitor has to go round regularly to pick up the paper screws thrown on the ground. The amount of pocket money given to these poor children is said on all hands to be extraordinary. More than mine have, says one of the clergy. More than I had when I was young, echoes a schoolmaster. Nevertheless, they have not the food they require. If not underfed, they are ill-fed. I do not say that in these matters Hoxton differs greatly from many other districts in London, but merely that these conditions are prominently present here, even more so perhaps than anywhere else, and make religious work exceptionally difficult. Among this very degraded population, many of whom are without grit, stamina, or backbone, and among whom sturdiness often tends to criminality, Social problems have to be faced as serious as any, and whatever plans may be adopted, men and women and money are required to carry them out. The clergy almost all complain that Huxton is a bad name to beg with. It is not associated with the ideas of poverty, which hang around the East End. For the same reason it is less easy to obtain workers from outside, while the material at hand is even less available for this purpose than in almost any other part. But it cannot be said that even when there is no lack of means to do everything that can be planned, the spiritual results are other than disappointing. Tested by attendance at church, we find everywhere small congregations, sometimes hardly any congregation at all, and those who come are often from a distance. Old parishioners, perhaps, who have improved their position in life and moved elsewhere, but whom remain attached to the religious organisation with which it may be their social welfare has been in some way connected. As to the mass of the residents in Hoxton, we hear that without contradiction, that not one grown-up person in thirty, or some say not one in fifty, and some again not one in eighty, attends any religious service. The priests assert that Hoxton has steadily, and for many years, been growing poorer, and in this sense all agree that there has been degradation, 
They also confirm all we hear of the character of the population in the worst streets and corroborate the statement of our other informants that for criminal habits the district has no equal. But in some respects there has been improvement. The place is more orderly. Drunken brawling in the streets is less common than it used to be.